With endless forests, granite cliffs, and waterfalls as old as time itself, Yosemite National Park is the domain of limitless beauty. But beauty, too, can be terrifying, a keeper of unexplainable secrets. Tales of blood-curdling accidents, reckless bravery, and even murder abound when it comes to Yosemite, a place that took its name from an old Miwok word meaning, they are killers. Join us as we discover these gruesome tales, but don't get lost. The park might claim you. What was supposed to be a fun girl's trip in the heart of nature turned into an absolute nightmare for 42-year-old Carol Sund, her 15-year-old daughter Julie, and 16-year-old Silvina Peloso. It was on February 12, 1999, that the three women left for a four-day vacation near Yosemite National Park. Carol, Julie, and Silvina left their home in Eureka, California, unafraid and oblivious to what was to come. We can only guess at the excitement the three women must have felt as they boarded their flight to San Francisco. Silvina was an exchange student from Argentina. She and Julie had become friends, and the sons were very happy to host her. Once they landed, Carol rented a red 1999 Pontiac Grand Prix. They had a lot to do and see, and only four days before they were supposed to meet Jens, Carol's husband, back at the San Francisco airport and accompany him on a business trip to Arizona. The women's first stop was Stockton, California. There, Julie took part in a cheerleading contest. After Julie's contest, the three women hit the road again. They arrived in El Portal, California on February 14th. They planned to stay there for a few days to explore Yosemite National Park. They got a room at Cedar Lodge, a resort located only eight miles away from the park's entrance. The women spent the following day, February 15th, hiking on one of the park's many trails. It was there in the middle of nature that Carol, Julie, and Sylvina were safest. Returning to Cedar Lodge for the night turned out to be an awful, unexpected mistake. The women left the park at some point during the evening. They were tired and wanted to unwind before getting some sleep. They had to return the rented car the next day and then meet Jens, Carol's husband, at the San Francisco airport. But in the hands of destiny, their plans were as good as nothing. Once they got back to Cedar Lodge, the group asked for some videos from the lodge's service desk. It was the last time anyone ever saw them alive. What transpired was a horrendous crime that shook America and marred National Park history. On February 16th, Yen Sund was astounded to see that Carol and the girls didn't show up at the airport the way they had agreed. Jens was worried enough to contact the police. Then the facts got muddier. It seemed that checkout had been made in advance. The keys were left inside the room and nothing was amiss. But there was no trace of the women, nor of the car Carol had rented. To make matters worse, the rental car company confirmed Carol had never returned the Pontiac. Local police, rangers, volunteers, family and friends all came together to comb through the park in a desperate attempt to find the women. Two weeks later, Carol's wallet inexplicably turned up in Modesto intact. Were they even alive? At this point, the situation looked dire. On March 18, 1999, Yen Sun's worst fears became reality. The red 1999 Pontiac was found, tucked away off Highway 108 in the Stanislaus Forest region, a region that locals used as a dumping ground. The car was burned out. Inside the car, authorities made a gruesome discovery. Two charred bodies, which were later identified as Carol Sund and Silvina Peloso, at this point, the FBI got involved. A week later, authorities received a note indicating the location of Yuli's body. We had fun with this one, the note cruelly said. Yuli Sun's body was discovered on March 25th near Lake Pedro in Tuolumne County. The body was severely decomposed, but the cause of death was clear. Yuli's throat had been slashed. It took another crime for the killer to be caught. Joey Ruth Armstrong was gruesomely murdered near her cabin. The day before, some witnesses had spotted a blue car parked near the woman's cabin. Police used this information to find Joey's killer and were stunned to find that all clues pointed to Carrie Stainer, a 37-year-old handyman at the Cedar Lodge Motel, who they had previously interviewed in connection to the Sund and Palazzo murders. This time, Stainer confessed. On the evening of February 15th, he held Carol, Julie, and Sylvina at gunpoint. He promised he wouldn't hurt them if only they cooperated. He lied. 
He bound and gagged the women, strangled and shot Carol, then sexually assaulted and killed Silvina Peloso, too. He then brought Julie to the lake, where he sexually assaulted her and then cut her throat. Although Stainer pleaded not guilty to the murders of the sons and Peloso, claiming insanity, the judge decided to sentence him to death three times, once for each murder. Carrie Stainer is now 62 years old and still alive. Dean Potter and Graham Hunt spent the afternoon of May 16, 2015, clearing trees and brush from Potter's recently bought property. The day had been rainy and cool, but as the skies cleared and the light dwindled, the two adventurers decided to head toward Yosemite National Park for a jump off Taft Point, a seven 500-foot promontory that overlooks some of Yosemite's most famous landmarks. The call of the wild, the call of adventure, was almost inescapable for the two men. Yosemite National Park was the background and reason for many of their adrenaline-filled experiences. The men knew that what they were about to do wasn't considered a go-to pastime activity for most people. But they weren't most people. They were base jumpers using their wingsuits and parachutes to dive off impressive cliffs from astonishing heights. At 43 years old, Dean Potter was one of the world's most experienced base jumpers and a legendary daredevil athlete. 29-year-old Graham Hunt was Potter's apprentice. But base jumping is illegal in all national parks. That's why they usually had to wait for dusk or dawn before attempting a jump. Otherwise, they could risk having their expensive gear confiscated or even spending months in jail. Potter and Hunt arrived at Taft Point along with Jen Rapp, Potter's longtime girlfriend. Rapp was to act as a spotter and photographer for the adventurers. At about 7.25 that evening, the two men were zipped up into their suits, ready to jump. They'd noticed a slight breeze picking up, but Potter's vast experience told him it was nothing to worry about. Neither of them was concerned. They had made the jump plenty of times before, together or alone. They cherished and sought the unique feeling of the drop, the adrenaline, and the gentle caress of the air as their wingsuits inflated. They planned to fly right toward the valley. To do this, the men had to clear Lost Brother, a ridge that extended downward, ending in a vertical wall. The ridge had a notch, a V-shaped indentation that was familiar to both jumpers. Hunt usually went through the notch, but Potter preferred to go around the ridge to the left. Potter was the first to jump. Hunt followed. Rap snapped pictures, but the men quickly fell out of frame before the lens caught them again, this time soaring. Hunt naturally passed Potter. His suit was made for speed while Potter's was adapted for long flights. Dean Potter often tried to improve his tactics. In fact, he'd spent some time in Canada working on a new design meant to allow him to land without using a parachute. He also constantly advocated for base jumping. Potter thought the sport should be legal in national parks, which he believed provided a great number of naturally safe spots for jumping. But something unexpected happened that evening. As Jen Rapp took pictures, she could see Graham Hunt veer left. Hunt immediately changed his mind and veered back to the right. Meanwhile, Dean Potter headed toward the notch. They disappeared into the hole out of Rapp's line of sight. Then a noise, a second duller, heavier noise followed. Rapp wouldn't, couldn't imagine the worst. She waited for a signal from the men, but nothing happened. Rapp left the park and met with Rebecca Haney, Hunt's girlfriend. Hain was worried sick. When it became clear that something terrible might have happened, the two women contacted Mike Gauthier, Yosemite's chief of staff. Gauthier was the one to assemble a team from Yosemite Search and Rescue. If Potter and Hunt were still alive and injured, time was of the essence. The team searched for hours to no avail. It wasn't until the following morning on May 17th that Potter and Hunt were found when a California state helicopter joined the search efforts. The pilots used Rapp's photos of the previous evening to pinpoint the likely location of the crash. Two rangers were then short-hauled onto the site. Dean Potter and Graham Hunt were dead. The bodies were recovered, and a memorial was set up on Taft Point. Feathers, a beer can, Tibetan prayer flags, and a photograph of Potter adorned the viewpoint when Rapp returned there, three days after the accident. The cause of the accident still remains a mystery, although theories abound. Some say Potter saw Hunt hit the wall and lost his focus, which caused his own crash. 
Others think Hunt's maneuvers and crash caused air disturbances, which carried Potter to his death. Potter had jumped with a smartphone strapped to his head, but the device was too damaged by the impact. The only one who knows the truth is Yosemite itself. There was one thing and one thing only Tomer Frankfurter wanted as he climbed over the cliff edge. Some really cool photos of his trip. He wasn't afraid. After all, Frankfurter knew he wouldn't be the first tourist to make risky decisions for an unforgettable memory. And he was young, barely 18 years old. At that age, everything seems possible. Everything except for the worst. It was September 4, 2018, and Tomer Frankfurter was visiting Yosemite National Park. The young man was on a two-month tour of the U.S., after which he had to return to his home in Israel to start his mandatory service in the Israeli army. Frankfurter spent his tour with a family friend from Fresno, California. Frankfurter and his friend arrived at Yosemite together. The day was warm and sunny. Frankfurter chose to follow the mist trail, Yosemite's signature hike. With awe-inspiring views scattered all along it, the mist trail is extremely popular with tourists. As such, it isn't exactly a lonely hike, but crowds thin out the closer you get to a truly spectacular place, the top of the Nevada Fall, a 594-foot-high waterfall on the Merced River. The more adventurous and fit tourists opt to hike the entirety of the mist trail in order to reach the top of the fall. On September 4, 2018, 18-year-old Tomer Frankfurter was one of them. At some point during the hike, Frankfurter and his friend got separated. But since the mist trail is so popular, it wasn't long until Frankfurter found a friendly group of tourists from Israel, Germany, and other countries, and decided to join them for the rest of the day. The trail became increasingly strenuous as they got closer to the top of Nevada Fall, but the effort was more than worth it. Once they got on top of the fall, the group decided it was time to eat lunch with a view. The place was breathtaking, with the thunderous roar of the water underlying the beauty of the valley below. As they prepared to head back, Tomer Frankfurter had a last-minute idea. He told his new friends he wanted to try and recreate a photo that got a lot of traction on social media. In it, a tourist visiting Telegraph Rock near Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, hanged from a rock outcropping as if the individual was thousands of feet above the ground. What Frankfurter didn't realize, though, was that the photo was merely an optical illusion, with the rock hanging just three feet above a trail below. Frankfurter tossed his backpack aside and handed his smartphone to a woman in the group, asking her to take some photos. Others in the group tried to intervene, arguing it was too dangerous, but Frankfurter was determined. He wanted those photos. Ignoring the others, the 18-year-old began climbing over the cliff edge and then dangled himself above the falls, the woman took several photos of Frankfurter. Then came a sudden plea for help. At first, some of the hikers thought the teenager was joking. But then they saw it. His arms were shaking, glistening with sweat. He was struggling to hold on. Several members of the group rushed to his aid, but trying to pull him back onto the trail turned impossible. The would-be saviors couldn't get a good grip of Frankfurter's sweaty arms, and there wasn't any equipment that could help them pull him. It was over in an instant. He slipped from their grasp. Then Tomer Frankfurter fell to his death, some 600 feet below, near the Merced River. He died on impact, becoming one of at least 300 people who died falling from a great height in Yosemite National Park. El Capitan, or the Chief, is Yosemite National Park's best-known landmark, a vertical rock formation looming 3,000 feet above the park. To some, El Capitan is one of Mother Nature's beautiful creations. To others, it's just some big rock. But there's also a special category of people, those who see El Capitan as a way of life, a place that feeds the soul. 42-year-old Tim Klein from Leona Valley, California, and 45-year-old Jason Wells from Boulder, Colorado were part of this special category of people. They were immensely experienced climbers, having conquered numerous walls and peaks. Both Klein and Wells regarded El Capitan as a one-of-a-kind place. Wells even called the granite monolith his magic stone. On the early morning of June 2, 2018, Tim Klein and Jason Wells were already up and doing what they loved best, speed climbing the 10-pitch free blast portion of El Capitan's Salate Wall. Their goal was straightforward, 
make an inner day ascent using a technique called short fixing. This wasn't the men's first rodeo. Klein and Wells had climbed El Cap about 70 times together, and they had nearly 200 El Capitan ascents between the two of them. The two men had almost legend status amidst the climbing community. They were known for always being joyful and, more importantly, swift and safe. They had been friends and climbing partners for decades, which enabled them to lap the monolith multiple times in the same weekend, or even twice in the same day. This time around, Klein and Wells were joined by a third climber, Kevin Prince. It was a typical busy Saturday on El Cap. Several teams of climbers were both ahead and behind Klein, Wells, and Prince. As the three men made their way up the Salathe Wall, they encountered Jordan Cannon and his team. They quickly passed Cannon, motoring up the wall. When Cannon looked at the men, it seemed to him that Wells and Klein were simul climbing. If his observation was correct, then Klein and Wells were tied into the same rope while moving at the same time. Cannon also noticed that Prince was solo climbing up a rope that Klein had secured to bolt anchors positioned above the half-dollar portion of the climb. It seemed to Cannon that the men moved quickly, short fixing without placing much protection. As Jason Wells and Tim Klein made their way through pitch 9 or 10, a moderately difficult portion of the climb, approaching Mammoth Terraces, luck and experience failed them. It was about 8.15 a.m. when Jordan Cannon, whom the men had passed earlier, heard a thud coming from above. When he looked up, Cannon saw Jason Wells fall about 196 feet before stopping briefly. Then Wells fell even farther and hit the wall. Almost instantly, Cannon heard Tim Klein screaming. Klein fell too. Their rope caught behind a block, suspending the men in the air for a very short moment. But then the rope was severed dooming Wells and Klein. The men fell to their deaths about 1,000 feet to the ground. Authorities couldn't determine why the two experienced climbers fell. According to Cannon, it was also impossible to determine if they had gear between them due to the rope being severed a few feet above Klein's knot. Their accident thus became yet another Yosemite mystery. Both Tim Klein and Jason Wells are remembered fondly by those who knew them and by those who were inspired by the duo's extraordinary performances. Klein was a beloved teacher at Palmdale High School, who earned Teacher of the Year twice. He leaves behind his wife and two young sons. Wells worked as an investment manager and is remembered for his immense love of climbing. It was more than a hundred years ago when the final 400-foot ascent of Half Dome, the iconic rock formation in Yosemite National Park, was fitted with cables. Standing at 8,800 feet above sea level, Half Dome has fascinated nature lovers and hikers for the longest time, despite the trickier parts of the hike. The reward, most people say, it's worth the effort. This was probably what Danielle Burnett believed, too. The 29-year-old woman loved nature and was particularly fond of hikes, especially when they provided wonderful views. And what better place for a striking view than Yosemite? Burnett, who was originally from Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and worked as a social media manager at Havasu Springs Resort in Parker, Arizona, arrived at the park on September 5, 2019. She had previously gotten a lottery-distributed permit to climb to the top of Half Dome, a necessity for all those who wished to venture on the hike. The Half Dome Trail traverses some 17 miles and gains about 4,800 feet in elevation. In other words, it's not a walk in the park. In fact, the last portion of the trail is particularly strenuous. That's why it was fitted with cables back in 1919. Hikers are advised to be cautious and avoid the trail if they're unprepared or out of shape. Even the most experienced hikers could face problems out there, with altitude sickness and changing weather being possible obstacles. But this wasn't Danielle Burnett's first time out on a hike. She was all right for the most part of the hike, that is, until she reached the strenuous and famous cable route. Sean Slimp and his group were also on the cable route when they heard a commotion above. When he looked up, Slimp saw Danielle Burnett struggling. A light sprinkle had started, which seemed to terrify Burnett. In her panic, Burnett decided getting to the top wasn't worth it. She needed to turn around even though her group continued on. Slimp watched as Burnett's shoes slipped on the rock. Then the woman fell hard. In an instant, she lost her grip on the cable and started sliding down. Slimp and one of his friends sprang into action trying to catch Burnett. It was of no use. She was simply too far from their reach. 
Slimp watched in horror as Danielle Burnett slipped past. Her screams pierced the air. Then she tumbled more than 500 feet down the rocky surface. The rest of the hikers had to be evacuated so a helicopter could fly in. When park rangers arrived on the scene, Danielle Burnett was already dead. Her family was devastated. Her sister, Nicole Burnett, posted a tribute on Facebook, asking people to allow her family to grieve in privacy. It's with a broken heart to inform you all that our beautiful Danielle left us yesterday doing something she loved so much, Nicole's post also said. According to the Mercury News, Danielle Burnett was at least the 12th person since 1995, whose life was claimed by Half Dome in Yosemite National Park.